So let's go ahead then and call the Johnson City Council meeting number 20-19 to order. Cindy, roll call, please. Councilmember Cope? Here. Evans? Here. Martin? Here. Ready? Here. Soroka? Here. Before we proceed with the rest of the agenda, let me uh, read the COVID-19 information statement. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with Governor Reynolds' March 19, 2020 proclamation, suspending the regulatory provisions of Iowa Code Section 21.8 or any other statute imposing a requirement to hold a public meeting or hearing, the City of Johnson will conduct meetings electronically with the public allowed to attend per instructions denoted on the meeting's particular agenda. Meeting minutes will continue to be posted per the city's normal course of business. And with that, I would like to welcome uh, any members of the public that are here with us this evening. Um, if you do want to speak on any item on the agenda this evening, uh, please indicate uh, in the chat box that you have that interest and we'll make sure that you have an opportunity to speak. There is also a, an opportunity under um, public communications for public comment uh, for anyone who would like to speak on an item that is not on the agenda. If the item is on the agenda, we would ask for you to wait until that item comes up and speak at that time. Cindy, do we have uh, members of the public uh, with us this evening that would like to speak? Uh, we do have um, Luke Slings from the Iowa National Guard who's going to speak during the public hearing. Okay, and that's all we that's, have. So far. That's all we have. Yes. Okay. Very good. Welcome, Luke. With that, we'll move on to the agenda approval. Uh, Jim, do we have any changes to the agenda? Is Jim with us? <laughs> he is with us. I'm sorry. Um, so the, the only thing uh, we, uh, from the work session, we decided to add the um, comprehensive plan and um, improvement, or excuse me, the comprehensive plan adoption process. We'll do that under, under staff comments. Okay, great. Council, any changes to the agenda? If not, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? Move approval, Evans. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Councilmember <clears throat> Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Taroka? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to public communications. We have several public uh, listed public communications this evening. We'll start off with um, item 4B, which is a proclamation of emergency 2020-02. Do we have uh, Chief Clark with us this evening? Yes, you do, Mayor. Chief, do you want to explain kind of the background and the purpose of this uh, uh, revision uh, amendment to the emergency proc? Yes, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the kind of fallouts of COVID that was affecting the Johnston public school system was that we have a local fire ordinance that requires that they do a fire drill monthly in each of the schools. And the minimum that has been uh, basically put out by the state fire code and uh, published by the state fire marshal is that they do uh, two per semester. And so uh, the superintendent asked if there was any way we could relax our local restrictions basically because of the limited amount of class time that the students are able to get uh, with this modified hybrid schedule where they're really only in the classroom about half of the time and then studying from home the other half of the time. And so we looked at that um, with advice from legal counsel. The best uh, way we found was to uh, add this to the emergency proclamation due to COVID that way uh, we didn't have to change the ordinance and publish uh, a hearing and go through the three readings like we normally do for all of our ordinances and then reverse that process through the same method. And so basically what we've added is that uh, 
due to uh, COVID, we're going to relax our restrictions and require only two fire drills per semester. Mm -hmm. And actually some of the schools are, are probably have already either accomplished that or halfway to that goal already, so. Any questions? Is there, Chief, would there be any consideration to making this a permanent change? Well, um, we have given them uh, leeway, like for inclement weather, because we know sometimes we get some really bad uh, inclement weather in December where we'll have several days, uh, you know, below uh, freezing temperatures. And so we'll, we'll allow them to relax and not uh, do a fire drill in inclement weather. So sometimes instead of four, um, we might only get three in a, in a semester. The problem with going back to saying we're gonna have two is that if they don't do the second one until December and then they get weather, then we're gonna end up with students out in the cold uh, during the fire drill where we'd rather have them um, try to do it in September, October, uh, find a day in November that works. That way we get three of them in instead of just saying, okay, well do two a semester and then what happens if we only get one in? Uh, then they could be going several months in between without uh, them practicing that fire drill. And our goal mm -hmm. is really make sure we create that muscle memory in the students so that they know what to do in the case of a fire drill and they know where to go, uh, where to meet. And so we get good accountability out on the playground or wherever their meeting is for their class. And then when we pull up on scene, we know that everybody's out of the building. Yeah, Superintendent Cates was very comfortable with the once per month uh, uh, pursuant to the International Fire Code um, during normal times. I mean, she brought this issue up to me at the homecoming parade and and uh, we followed up with uh, the chief and, and he had conversations with Tim Pearson about the best approach to dealing with it. So she's, she's fine with it under normal circumstances. She was just saying that, you know, given, uh, given the limited number of hours that the kids are in, in the classroom now, um, it's just very difficult to uh, comply with it. And so this, she's, you know, this, this is a uh, very efficient way to address it, and she's very appreciative that we were able to find such an easy solution. So we will uh, we'll be signing that, and, and uh, I'm sh have we already informed uh, uh, Superintendent Kaser Chief that this is on the agenda this evening? Yes, we have, and uh, unfortunately, I got to see her last week. We had. Uh, a couple of actual fires in schools. It wasn't uh, anything major. Uh, one was a uh, uh, heating ventilation unit and another one was a, a belt that burned up on a compressor, but we did have two school evacuations last week and everything went well. And so I reminded her that those both counted as part of their fire drills. And so um, yeah, we had a conversation about it and she knew about this and was very appreciative uh, that this was going to be on the agenda Monday. Very good. Very good. Well, with that as a segue, we have a, a, a proclamation for Fire Prevention Week. Do you want to take that one up, Chief? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. And uh, we appreciate this. Um, every year uh, around October 9th, which is a uh, historic day, and that's kind of the day that uh, the great uh, Chicago fire uh, started, um, it actually started uh, late the evening of the 8th, but most of the fire um, burnt and most of the firefighters uh, tried to put it out during the 9th. And so each year, the week that October 9th falls in is designated uh, as Fire Prevention Week, uh, going back several decades. And so um, we just push this forward again in front of the council and ask that uh, this proclamation uh, be adopted by the city council for our fire prevention week this year. Uh, the theme is serve up safety in the kitchen. And the goal is to remind people to take the needed steps to increase their personal safety in the kitchen. Uh, that's where the majority of the home fires start and the majority of injuries uh, happen in the home are in the kitchen. So
so we will be uh, signing this proclamation as well. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Chief, that most of the fires start in the kitchen of a home. I, I think that under the circumstances that we're all living in right now, we're all reacquainting ourselves to our kitchens. Um, and uh, so need to be reminded of the, uh, you know, the safety precautions that we need to take in terms of, uh, you know, fire and, and, and cooking and in particular with kids and the, uh, you know, the risks that are involved with that. So we will, uh, we will uh, sign the proclamation and, and recognize the next week then as Fire Prevention Week. Moving on to the next proclamation, Breast Cancer Awareness. And I think, uh, um, I don't know who wants to take the lead on this, but we have uh, both of our public safety agencies involved in this one. So. Uh, Chief Clark, uh, Chief uh, McDaniel, which which one wants to take the lead on this? I can uh, go ahead and take the lead on this. Uh, again, uh, October uh, nationally is observed as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, both police and firefighters across the country, uh, this is one of the causes that they champion. Um, both the uh, Firefighters Local Union and the Police Officers Association have been raising funds uh, to donate through this campaign. Firefighters uh, are, are or were selling t-shirts and so uh, they raised $2,000 and that's going to go directly to a local recipient uh, that lives here in Johnston, a uh, cancer uh, patient and survivor. And then we also have the police department selling their pink patch. Uh, I know the mayor's got one, wears it on one of her, uh, one of her coats. And uh, they're selling these patches and the funds that they receive uh, through the sales of the patches, those are gonna go directly to the Susan G. Coleman Foundation, uh, the local chapter here in the Des Moines area. So uh, again, just a proclamation to recognize uh, the Breast Cancer Awareness Month and then recognize the efforts of the firefighters and the police officer and the funds that they're raising uh, to go to good causes. Well, Chief, we have to thank both of the departments for participating in, uh, in this initiative. It is, uh, it, it is important um, and, uh, you know, it's something that you know, incredibly has caught on well across the country and, and for, for good reasons. Um, I do have my patch and, and I didn't, didn't get in today to get my t-shirt, but I intend to do that tomorrow so that I can contribute to, uh, the firefighters, uh, effort in, in this as well. So again, thank you. Uh, thank you chiefs for, for what you're doing to support, uh, this important campaign. And it's a good way to repurpose an old, uh, old jacket that you weren't wearing anyway. <laughs> Very good, thank you, Mayor. You bet. Moving on to the next one, the National Community Planning Month Proclamation. Uh, I'm assuming this is probably Dave Overding. Uh, yeah, this is uh, just our annual um, uh, proclamation that we do. It's sponsored by the American Planning Association uh, and their professional institute, the American Institute of Certified Planners. Uh, it's really an opportunity to recognize the efforts and the value that planning has in our community and especially, um, you know, our, our planning and zoning commissioner, board of adjustment, city council, our citizen planners, as we like to, to call them, that uh, contribute to, to planning throughout the year. Uh, you know, um, this particular October 2020 is going to be a, a huge, uh, a huge month for, um, for Johnston. Um, we're gearing up to adopt our Thrive 2040 plan. We're missing that um, by a couple of days. It's currently scheduled for November 2nd. Um, but you know, that's an 18 month process that will guide the future of our community for many, many years to come. Um, and on top of that, we're going to be moving into the Johnson City Hall, which is, um, you know, part of the Johnson Town Center. Again, a planning effort that has uh, been going on really dating back to our very first comp plan, which envisioned a, a retail center on the north end of Merle Hay Road. So um, a long time in coming. And so it's a um, this is a pretty timely uh, proclamation just in all the activities we have going on uh, uh, here in the coming month. Well, we all certainly appreciate uh, all the work that our city planners and, and the community development 
department do? You know, I think that's, I think there's this impression that because we were all dealing with, with the pandemic in 2020, that not much got done. But you can see in, in your one paragraph there that that simply was not the case uh, here in Johnston and, and not with community development. A heck of a lot got done. So um, thanks to you, David, and thanks to your entire team for, for um, helping us uh, push forward and, and uh, uh, make uh, Johnston an even better place for residents and, and visitors. So thank you. We will, uh, we'll get that one signed as well. So with that, I think we're through uh, the proclamations or other items that were listed in our public communications. Do we have any members of the public with us, Cindy, that would wanted to address us under public communications? I do not see any. Okay, very good. Then we will move on to public hearings. And we have one public hearing this evening, and that is to conduct a public hearing and consider approval of the first reading of ordinance number 1031, an ordinance vacating a portion of Northwest Road Drive right away east of Northwest 110th Court. And we will open this public hearing at 7.32. This is Clayton Ender. Um, this is a pretty straightforward uh, request from Camp Dodge um, to vacate a portion of Northwest Road Drive. This is a roadway that was annexed into the city in 2018. Um, we have the north half of the road. Polk County had the south half. Polk County's already vacated uh, their portion of the roadway. The state of Iowa owns all adjoining property on really all sides of that. So it's just a dead end road into the camp. Um, they would like it to be vacated so that they can construct a new convoy entrance off of Northwest 110th Corps and have better control of their boundary. Uh, Planning and Zoning Commission has reviewed this and is recommending uh, City Council approval. Luke Slings with the Iowa National Guard is in attendance. And I do believe he indicated he'd like to speak on this item. I'd be happy to answer any questions or go into further detail if needed. Thank you, Clayton. Does the council have any questions for Clayton? If not, Luke, uh, did you want to make a few comments? Sure, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, just for the record, my name is Luke Slings. I'm with the Iowa National Guard and the address here is uh, 7105 Northwest 70th Avenue. Uh, first, we would just like to thank the city staff for all the work they've done so far on this request. We obviously support this ordinance. Uh, I'd like to add to what was mentioned in the staff report and Clayton actually kind of stole my thunder a little bit here, but um, I wanna say that it's our long-term goal uh, to be able to route military vehicle convoys into Camp Dodge from the north via Highway 141 rather than uh, via Northwest 70th. So the vacation of this section of uh, Northwest Road Drive actually lays the groundwork for those access improvements. Uh, pending your questions, that's, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Luke. Any questions for Luke? I would, just, I would just say that um, while it, it certainly makes sense for this new routing, as somebody who lives pretty close to 86th Street, I, it is, is often reassuring and, and a, a positive uh, to see those convoys coming down 86th Street and uh, somewhat sad that we won't see them maybe quite as much. So we'll miss that, but we'll find a way to, to see, still see the National Guard continue to do its fine work. Any other comments? If not, we will then close the public hearing at 735. Do we have a motion to approve first reading of ordinance number 1031? A motion. Second, Scott. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Councilmember Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move approval, Evans. Second, Martin. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Council member ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Pope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. 
Moving on to the non-consent agenda, item 8A, consider resolution number 20-235, directing sale of $2,810,000, subject to adjustment per terms of offering, taxable general obligation, urban renewal, capital loan notes, series 2020E. And I'm guessing this is Teresa. Good evening. Uh, I also have um, Matt Stoffel, I believe, on the line. And um, Matt will uh, talk through the bid tabs, but we had uh, really, really good bids. You'll see by the interest rate there in front of you. And um, unbelievable, right? Um, mm -hmm. Matt, you wanna mm -hmm. go ahead? Yeah, uh, just to echo Teresa, we had six bids today. Um, the, the low bid was um, UMB Bank out of Kansas City, Missouri. They bid a 1.01%. Um, and then the high bid was Piper Sandler um, out of Chicago. They bid a 1.26%. So interest rates are down considerably um, from where they were the last time the city borrowed back in February. Um, so that's a um, so that's a good thing. And so these came in um, almost 70 basis points lower than we had planned back in um, July. So. Um, I, I do think that Charter Bank um, participating in the bid with UMB Bank helped drive their interest rate lower. You can see there's there's um, a tenth of a percent between the, the first and the second bid there. Um, so this is to fund the taxable portion of the developer agreements for the Ignite project. Um, so we were really happy with the bids and we would, PFM would recommend um, that the city award to UMB Bank, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Council, have any questions? If not, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 20 235? Move approval, Cope. Second, Evans. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Council Member Sirocco? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you, Matt. Item 8B, consider resolution number 20-237, a resolution approving an additional mm -hmm. transfer for 2020-21 fiscal year. Yes, this is me. Um, this transfer basically is kind of a culmination over the last three or four weeks, uh, um, talking with staff, talking with the tree board and park board. Um, obviously, everybody knows it was a, a real tough weather year this year. Um, three different windstorms created a lot of damage to our, our tree inventory, um, both in the public, but also a lot in the private. And uh, one of the things, talking with the staff and that, we decided we would really like to see if it was possible was to do a mini uh, residential tree sale similar to what we do in the spring. Um, we did not have funds available for that. Um, that's where this transfer would come in place. Um, this, the funds that we have available would be coming out of our recreation program um, due to COVID. Obviously, we don't have the face-to-face -face recreation programs that we were planning this year, so we would have the availability to transfer that $6,000 to make this program available. Um, we have done the research. We do have the, uh, the ability to get a total of 60 trees, 20 of each of three different species, which would be um, our uh, uh, northern red oak, our, our snow crab apple, and our black hill spruce. Um, we feel all three species would be extremely popular and uh, would just be a kind of a good, a feel good thing um, that we could do for our residents here. So with that, uh, I'd take any questions that you might have. Does the council have any questions? I'm on the, uh, yes, Mayor. I'm on the tree board and I appreciate that uh, John brought this forward to the tree board. Um, I think it's a fabulous idea and uh, um, I'm very much in support. Any other questions or comments? Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 20-237? So moved, Martin. I second, Therese. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Council Member Cope? 
Yes. Evans? Yes. Harden? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8C, consider approval of, of the following items related to the boundary adjustment between the City of Urbandale and the City of Johnston. Resolution 20-233, a resolution approving form and authorizing execution of petition for boundary adjustment for real estate owned by the City of Johnston, Iowa. Resolution 20-234, a resolution setting date of public hearing, directing, directing publication of notice and directing the mailing of notice of hearing on petition for voluntary, voluntary boundary adjustment. Ms. Clayton, um, typically we would uh, do this under a consent agenda item, um, but being that this is public land owned by the city of Johnston, we felt it prudent to do it as non-consent for transparency. Um, this would just be uh, getting the petition to start the boundary adjustment between the city of Urbandale and the city of Johnston um, to sever that 11.27 acres that we purchased uh, that was approved at your last meeting. Um, and then I would subsequently be annexed then into the city of Johnston. Uh, this area is intended to help support the development of the Ignite Sports Complex uh, just on the Merle Hay Road Great Gateway area. Um, so really just a procedural item, but just for transparency purposes, we wanted it here on the non-consent. Be happy to answer questions or go into further detail. Any questions for Clayton? If not, we have two resolutions here. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 20 233? I move, Suresh. Second, Cope. We have a motion in the second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Motion passed. And do we have a uh, motion to approve resolution number 20 234? I move, Suresh. Second, Martin. Martin. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8D, consider first reading of Ordinance 1032, amending ordinances number, numbers 531, 598, 778, 885, and 1022, and providing that general property taxes shall no longer be divided on certain property located within the amended Northwest 62nd Avenue urban renewal area in the city of Johnson, County of Polk, state of Iowa. Removing amendment number one area and amendment number two area from division of taxes only. Good evening, council. Uh, last year, we terminated the sub area, the original sub area of Northwest 62nd. Uh, and this year we're prepared to terminate uh, sub area one and sub area two of the Northwest 62nd Avenue. Uh, this is the urban renewal area that's served for uh, about 20 years now a number of Pioneer, now Corteva projects. Uh, I've got written in here over $100 million worth of private development. I did the math a couple of years ago and it's actually well in excess of that. It's probably closer to 200 million in development. And that's helped fund a number of public improvements such as Northwest 62nd Avenue and Terra Park. Uh, we do have a couple of outstanding active Corteva, Corteva development agreements, uh, but those will be concluding in the next couple of years and we have or will collect uh, the necessary increments um, up until June 1st of 2021 when these areas would be terminated to fulfill those agreements. So for the time being, uh, that would uh, conclude our collection of increment within the Northwest 62nd urban renewal area. Uh, if future projects are identified, uh, there could be a creation of a new sub area uh, to work through uh, any development agreements that would happen at that time. Uh, with that, happy to answer any questions. Do you have any questions for Adam? Adam, this is Suresh. So this 20-year mandate will ended in 2019, and you're ending this next thing on 21. There's a two-year gap between the actual ending and actual stopping it. So there's a 20-year mandate on each of the actual TIF ordinances, which is the ordinance that actually allows collection of increments. Uh, so the urban renewal areas sort of live on, uh, unless you were to close them out, they don't actively collect any increments. 
And so that original area was created uh, now 21 years ago, if memory serves. Um, we did close out uh, that original area last year, and we're closing these two a little bit prematurely uh, just because they're getting near the end of their life and we don't have the need to collect any additional increment. Uh, but each one of these sub areas is uh, treated separately uh, and stipulated by that 20 year rule. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Adam? If not, do we have a motion to approve first reading of ordinance number 1032? So moved, Evans. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Reddy? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8E, consider change orders number 20 and 21 with Hanson JTC LLC for the Johnston Town Center project. Good evening, just two real simple change orders tonight on the Town Center project. Uh, the one is adding a couple of additional signage, uh, signage internal to the building, uh, which adjusted a previous change order that we approved by $355. And then change order 21, uh, the city, uh, as part of our bid documents, was to provide the wireless or Wi-Fi access points throughout the building, uh, which we've done. Um, however, um, it was more efficient to have Waldinger, who's doing all the other <coughs> electrical work in the, in the city hall. Um, to actually install those because they already have lifts and, and such on site, particularly in the high roof um, portions of the building. So um, that change order 21 is to get those installed uh, within the building. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for David? Hmm. If not, do we have a motion to approve change, or, change orders number 20 and 21 with Hanson JTC? Move approval. Move approval. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Martin? I think we lost two. Ready? Yes. Councilmember Martin? No, I still see her on, but I don't see it. I just got a text from Councilmember Martin, and she says she votes yes. Okay. We must have lost our, our audio, but she did text me to say she did vote yes on this. Okay. Thank you. Motion, motion passed. Moving on to item 8F, consider resolution number 20-244, approving amendment number one to master development agreement between the City of Johnson and Hanson JTC LLC. Uh, in October of 2019, the city passed the master development agreement along with the lease purchase agreement uh, with Hanson uh, to begin the town center project. Uh, that master development agreement would have required the acquisition of the first development parcel uh, by March 1st, 2020, and completion of the first commercial building uh, by December 31st, 2021. Um, we began some conversations with Hanson late February, early March. Of this year, uh, there's a need for some additional time. Uh, they're having some challenges securing pre-construction leases on that commercial building. Uh, shortly after engaging those conversations, the COVID uh, pandemic hit, and uh, we've been sort of continuing that dialogue uh, through these evolving circumstances since then. Uh, at one point, we were very close to being able to break ground, I think, or finish design work on the initial building, and then uh, the pandemic really escalated and, and constructing a uh, purely speculative building just did not look like a possibility at that time. Uh, so this uh, amendment number one is really a culmination of about six months of conversation between staff, uh, consultant Matt Brown, uh, Hansen, uh, and the Economic Development Committee uh, to come to amended terms uh, to be able to move this project forward. 
it really focuses on uh, continuing and strengthening that communication between Hanson and the Economic Development Committee so we can adapt to the changes in the environment here, um, be able to take a look at uh, different projects and uh, different marketing opportunities as they come along. Uh, and so you'll see in here, uh, it, it proposes uh, an adjustment of that date for the closing, uh, essentially to January 1st of 2021. Uh, construction of that building by October 31st, 2021. Now, we're also acknowledging that uh, those timelines uh, may not be realistic, again, given uh, the extension of the COVID crisis. Uh, and so it gives us the opportunity to look at sort of six month intervals, um, additional extensions uh, off of those dates um, based off of kind of uh, produ productive marketing efforts and, and the circumstances kind of beyond everybody's control here. Uh, you will see in November, um, a little bit more discussion off of the marketing strategy, uh, as well as some additional communication going forward, uh, both through the Economic Development Committee and, and more regularly here at Council. Uh, that marketing strategy may include a potential co-brokerage strategy. That's something we've talked about and still being flushed out a little bit. Uh, and Amendment 1 also clarifies ownership of some intellectual rights associated with the Johnston Town Center, such as the logo. And it also opens up the hotel parcel uh, to be marketed to anybody in the development community since that's more of a specialized development parcel as opposed to a more traditional retail uh, commercial building. Obviously that's it's a difficult parcel to market right now in the current uh, the current climate uh, but when the uh, hospitality industry uh, bounces back hopefully um, we should be able to offer that to a variety of different developers out there. Uh, so Hanson's con continuing to engage in conversations. There's a number of breweries that they're in conversations with. Uh, Jim Sanders set us up with a good meeting with the uh, Kosovo consulate a couple of weeks ago about an Italian restaurant here uh, from Kosovo. Uh, and so we've had some good conversations with them, um, but hopefully we'll see uh, some increased activity uh, in the first building uh, get underway in construction here in 21. And I believe Troy uh, Hanson was going to try to join us this evening. Uh, Troy, if you're there, do you have any additional comment? Is not here. Okay. Uh, so I'll pause there. I also do have a real quick update uh, on the venue operator, but see if there's any questions related to the master development agreement amendment first. Adam, should we go ahead and, and approve the resolution? Or did you want to make your comments about the vendor first? I'll just make the, the vendor comments real quickly. Um, so the Economic Development Committee did meet with uh, two prospective uh, uh, vendors to run the uh, town center venue, uh, the ice rink, uh, the amphitheater stage and the area known as the yard. Uh, they did select uh, venue works to kind of continue those conversations with, uh, flush out a little bit more detail what that programming and that budget might be. Uh, and to come back hopefully with a, a contract for consideration after a little bit more discussion at the Economic Development Committee. So um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to work through that and be able to adapt to the kind of the circumstances that we have out there and be able to work with uh, Venue Works on finishing some design work, uh, both in the ice skating rink and the concession stand building. Any questions for Adam on that? Uh, Mayor, can we go back to the master development agreement just for a quick question? Sure. So, Adam, so back when the original the original date was March 2020 that they were needing to, uh, in essence, either close on that first property, and and they missed that. And then, so I know we had a bunch of discussions in the spring or fall, but that none of those discussions actually didn't result in an amendment to the doc contract. To our agreement, this is actually the first amendment. Or how? What is, what is different from those conversations that we had, and and what we're doing here? That's correct. There was never actually an amendment done to the master development agreement. Uh, there was a lot of conversation. Uh, I think we had reached uh, near terms of having that uh, amendment in place, uh, and then it became abundantly clear that the the COVID impact was going to be a fairly long term, and so. Uh, both parties kind of reevaluated what was in that amendment uh, through several more months of conversation. So um, technically Hanson was in violation of the master development agreement, but the city did not serve them notice. Uh, and so it was just sort of a continuation of the pre-existing agreement up until today where we'll uh, consider the formalizing um, the current terms. And as I read it, so basically they have until January 1st of 2021 
to close on a property, but they can give us notice by a date in December to say, no, we don't, we can't meet that deadline and push that deadline back six months. Is that right? Uh, they can request an extension of six months from that deadline um, that council can consider. Uh, yes, which would push that uh, over to June. And do they, do they have the opportunity to request an unlimited number of extensions or just one or how does that work? Uh, they have the uh, ability to request uh, an unspecified number of extensions uh, and city council has the right to evaluate the marketing and the brokerage strategy um, within the context of uh, kind of progress in developing that and external, condi uh, external conditions such as COVID uh, and make a decision of whether to grant those extensions at that time or not. Okay, great. Thanks. I just, just kind of wanted to understand how the, how the kind of the arrangement will work and I appreciate you helping me. Uh, understand that better. Thank you. Any other questions for Adam? Uh, Adam, yes. Yeah. So if if they're not going to do anything with those outlots, are they going to keep them graded, seated? Are they going to be nasty looking construction? What What's the plan? Uh, the property is currently the city of Johnston's, and so it's part of our mowing plan and maintenance plan uh, throughout the town center of here the first couple of years where the parks uh, department will be maintaining that. So, uh, Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that will all be seated uh, and then mowed by our parks department until such time as uh, the property is purchased by Hanson or a developer. Yeah, that's correct. Everything will be graded um, <clears throat> and seated, so it should be kept in good order. Thank you. I guess one more question. If Hanson does not ask for another extension or, or if we deny them another extension, then what happens? Uh, at that point, we'll have a decision of whether we would like to pursue uh, an arrangement with another developer uh, or brokerage agency. Uh, if there wanna be some internal efforts to try to market the property such as on CoStar, um, you know, I guess there's a number of options that could be considered so far as drastic as the city um, potentially constructing a building, but I would suppose that the, the logical route would be again to look at uh, the brokerage community and, and see if there's somebody that uh, is ready to move forward with developments in the near future. Thank you. Any other questions for Adam? If not, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 20-244? I move, Suresh. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? She may still be struggling. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Councilmember Martin? He needs to unmute. Oops. I don't think um, it didn't work. Nope. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Motion passed. <laughs> Moving on to item 8G. Consider approval of professional services contract with HR Green to conduct broadband visioning study. This is me again. Uh, in 2019, City Council approved a decision package for up to $25,000 to conduct a broadband visioning study. Uh, we looked at that time kind of a number of options there, but wanted to restrict uh, the initial uh, decision package to looking at what our current situation was uh, with broadband connectivity in Johnston and uh, kind of a diverse range of ways that uh, we could improve that through surveying the public and doing an analysis of our existing resources uh, on the public sector. Uh, we did uh, release an RFP out uh, earlier this year. Uh, we believe, I believe we received nine responses to that, a diverse range of both local uh, and national firms. 
Uh, the Economic Development Committee interviewed three of those respondents uh, and recommended moving forward with HR Green uh, based here in Johnston. HR Green has a diverse team, um, so they have a number of sub consultants within that that have different areas of expertise kind of focusing on components of divisioning process. Uh, and they're also, it appears going to be selected by the Greater Des Moines Partnership, who is doing a metro wide broadband study um, that'll take a look at uh, what broadband needs will be in the greater metropolitan area as well. So uh, there's some good synergies there, hopefully, with HR Green and what they'll be doing in the, uh, the greater Des Moines area, as well as, as well as the more specific visioning study uh, they'll be doing here in Johnston. Um, we do hope to get this kicked off here shortly, uh, subject to approval. Uh, the contract is for not to exceed $25,000. Uh, the scope is in line with what we released out in the RFP, uh, which at a very high level is to look at and verify the existing city broadband assets, uh, look at the current industry, uh, who's playing in the fields and what the customer satisfaction levels are as far as the speed, demand, price. Um, and they'll do that through a community engagement survey. Uh, we're going to have a kickoff meeting here, hopefully within the next couple of weeks to see if it's possible to integrate that into the existing community survey and the business survey uh, that we'll be doing this year. Uh, if not, there'll be individual surveys uh, that'll be conducted online. Uh, there'll be some online public engagement and conversations, most likely through Zoom and Facebook Live, given the current uh, climate. Uh, and then they'll review the city permitting and policy process uh, for working in the right of way and uh, working with broadband companies. And then they'll conduct a, they'll conduct a gap analysis. Uh, kind of the phase two of this then would be to look at those gaps and provide us with a number of options um, to how to, uh, to make those improvements kind of being uh, demanded through that visioning uh, process. Uh, that should be a neutral sort of development uh, that is subject to what the feedback we receive uh, from the community at that point. So that could include public investments, private investments, uh, or a partial public and private investment. Uh, and that will conclude with some visioning meetings, a uh, summary report, a report out uh, to the city council uh, and the community at large. Uh, some aspects that kind of came out during our committee discussions is that the uh, recommendation should be technology and vendor neutral and will take into account the Metronet uh, 2021 build out of the fiber system that's being planned. Uh, and that uh, just kind of want to point out here, I guess this is step one of what could be multiple steps of uh, looking at ways to increase the broadband connectivity in the Johnston area. Um, if there was a public uh, kind of process to do public improvements or build some sort of a public network, uh, that's a very in-depth process. Uh, and so this would be kind of the first leg of kind of acknowledging that maybe that is the path that we're going forward with. Or if not, uh, there could be negotiations with uh, different private entities uh, that are outside of the scope of this visioning process as well. So this really kind of kicks off uh, the awareness of where we're at. Uh, with broadband and what future our needs in that sector will be in Johnston going forward. Uh, results and good public public and private, uh, given the uh, the increased demand and needs for that uh, in 2020. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. So Adam, that's a search. Can you explain about the process where there will be sending out a survey to the residents of Johnston? Is that part of the general survey or is that a survey particular to just the broadband? Uh, what was initially anticipated in the RFP is there would be a, a specific broadband survey uh, that would inquire about uh, who a customer's existing service provider is, uh, what those speeds are. So it would include a speed test both up and down. So that essentially they'd get a link that they could click on and test their speeds. They can look at the pricing or they would ask about the pricing and whether they're satisfied with the customer's service and with the pricing. Uh, and then also ask them sort of what their future needs or what their current needs are and whether they're being met. Uh, so that would be a specific broadband only survey um, now that could be integrated potentially on the business side of things into our business survey, uh, but it would likely be a standalone survey that may be linked to through the community survey or just maybe independently distributed uh, as far as the individual non-business component. Okay. 
Well, I was preferring that this, it be this be a specific broadband. Uh, if you put it in a business or community, that will be a few questions among a lot of other questions. So. Yes, that's that's a fair point. I'm a little worried about inundating our business community with a lot of surveys. They've gone through a number of COVID surveys. Uh, we're going to do uh, sure. a business survey again that we've been funded with uh, through COVID money again here now to CARES Act. Uh, and then there'd be this broadband one. So uh, depending on the scope of our questions on that business survey, we may be able to uh, do quite a number of broadband questions on that business one. Uh, but if those timelines don't match or there's too many broadband questions, uh, we can isolate that out. That okay. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Any other questions for Adam? Yeah, this is just Tom. I, I think that, um, I think we have to, you know, be a little careful about surveys that start asking about customer satisfaction with a private sector product. Um, as a, that might be getting beyond the role of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, I, I think that I, I fully support the concept of measuring speed and, um, and measuring what people have access to in their homes. Um, I, I'm a little hesitant to get into the business of measuring how satisfied people are with a specific provider in the community um, is I think that's uh, I think that's creates some potential problems. So I think we really have to think through um, how we approach this. Um, I, I, to me, I think the va I, I'm very excited about this project because I, I really do believe that we need to, um, that it's important for the residents of Johnson to have access to high-speed internet. Um, but I, 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 I think that there's lots of ways that that can be accomplished. And I certainly don't believe that um, that it has to be done using a public entity. I think hopefully we can we can solve it. There's lots of ways we can solve the problem. I'm not prepared today to say how we should solve it or how we should not solve it, but I think it's important that we keep our options open. Um, so uh, I think you know it's important to note we're only spending twenty five thousand dollars on this um, on this contract, and if we aren't careful, we could very easily turn this into a two hundred fifty thousand dollar contract, which I don't think we have the resources to do. And so I think we have to be really careful about considering what's a priority as part of this project. So um, I just think we have to keep that in mind as we put this together. Any other questions for Adam? If not, do we have a motion to approve the professional services contract with HR Green? Move approval, Cope. I second, Suresh. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Betty? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8H consider approval of claims in the amount of 1126000 Cindy, you just covered, there we go. $1,126,320.96. Do we have a motion to approve? Move approval, Evans. Second, Cope. Second. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to city administrator staff comments. Jim? I've got several comments this evening, but let's go ahead and start with David going back to the 2040 comp plan adoption process, which we um, didn't get to during the work session. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, so back in uh, the um, agenda for the work session, there were a couple of attachments, including a memo from me kind of outlining our community engagement process, as well as um, sort of our uh, vision for moving forward with the comprehensive plan. And so I just want to touch on sort of uh, what we've heard and what changes we've made and sort of what our plan is moving forward. So the first part of that memo covers the three various phases that we did throughout the last 18 months in developing the Thrive 2040 plan and the engagement that we received in, in each of those um, steps or processes. 
Uh, we just concluded the phase three where we um, rolled out the draft document for review, seeking comments. Uh, as the council is aware, our original intent was to do a traditional public open house and then COVID hit and we had to um, uh, come up with a, uh, a new plan where we did the, the three part approach um, um, dating back from late July to early, or early September, excuse me. We did the online virtual open house, which actually is still available online uh, where there's videos, the draft plan, um, display boards, et cetera. Um, easy way to kind of um, dive into specific areas of the plan. Uh, we offered an open house by appointment, had about 10 folks that took us up on that. And then we did a live virtual chat at the end of August via Zoom uh, where residents could ask questions and we had about 20 folks that participated in that. So uh, not overwhelming response um, through that process, um, but certainly um, um, there was still quite a bit of um, comments received. All of those comments from all three of the phases of engagement are included uh, in the attached community engagement summary, um, final September 2020 there in that document. Um, what, what I'm really proud of, we started this process about 18 months ago and my challenge to our consulting team was to make sure this was a very in, an engaged process where our community was engaged in the process throughout that we um, took their feedback and, and I know no one wants to read a 90 page document, but we now have a 90 page summary of the comments received over that 18 month period. So a tremendous amount of um, input has come into this process from our residents through various community events to the online surveys that we did on the various meetings we attended, et cetera. We have developed sort of a list of some of the common topic areas that we heard. And we've also developed a frequently asked question, which provides a little bit of response to each of those. Um, that document is attached as well. I wasn't planning to go through uh, those in detail tonight, but if the council has specific questions, I'd be happy to address any of those. Um, so sort of following the conclusion of the public comment period, we did identify a number of things that need some amendments so or making some final revisions right now. Um, to get the document in a state where we think it could be uh, ready for adoption. And uh, those changes are reflected in the, the draft that's attached to the agenda item as well. Where I really wanted to sort of get direction from the council, we received uh, two different requests um, for amendments to the future land use map. Uh, one is a fairly significant one uh, in Windsor Office Park, the south side of Windsor Parkway, um, increasing the amount of high density residential that's proposed there. Uh, and then one is a fairly small one at on the um, would be the northeast corner of Northwest Beaver Drive and Northwest 66th Avenue, the the parcel that's adjacent to the soccer fields. It's long been zoned commercial. There's a desire to do um, some residential on a portion of that. Uh, the concern staff has at this time is particularly in the Windsor Office Park one. It's a pretty significant change. We've had a draft land use plan um, that's been out for public review since February, um, so a pretty significant amount of time. And none of the staff or none of the public has been able to comment on this proposal. Um, and so we're worried about sort of undermining that involvement process and um, have recommended um, and I, you know, we always say plans are living and breathing documents and they need to change from time to time. So what I'm, I guess we're, we're talking in that vein. What I'm suggesting is that we would adopt the plan and the future land use map as it is um, with the understanding that we're likely to gonna, going to be having some amendment requests coming in a, in a fairly short order. Um, um, and that process then would allow for a more involved public dialogue specific to those, uh, specific to those changes since they would be a, a fairly, um, um, within the Windsor Office Park in, in particular would be a fairly um, big change from what's been planned there historically. Uh, we did discuss this with the Planning Commission and um, they were, um, in favor of staff's recommendation and uh, made that recommendation as well. So um, happy to answer questions on that particular item and uh, would like some direction from the from the council. Our plan going forward uh, would be a public hearing before the Planning and Zoning Commission on October 26th. Um, we'll take the item to the uh, Park and Recreation Board on October 27th uh, and that would set it up assuming um, no issues come out of those two meetings that would set it up for consideration in front of the council on November 2nd. So that's a lot there. There's a lot of attachments and a lot of information, but I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions and welcome any feedback on the um, changes to the land use. Yeah. 
Any questions for David or any feedback on the specific uh, issues that he raised? Dave, Tom Cope here, just a technical thing. I, would you, when it gets time for the, uh, pub, the P and Z public hearing, would you uh, kind of send us an uh, invite to that so that we have the information? I presume you'll do it a Zoom call or whatever. Yes, absolutely, yep. I always sort of think it's good for us to hear what they're hearing and, and vice versa. And so um, just would like to be able to listen in on that as well. So if you could send that around, that'd be great. Absolutely, we'll share that. Um, and I didn't have a question, but just a quick comment of um, thanks again to everyone who worked on this. Um, I mean, even just going through these materials, it was a reminder of how detailed and how much thought was put into it. So that was super appreciated. And then also just a quick plug of thanks um, on listening to our feedback previously about um, breaking out the proposed changes um, so that they weren't rolled into this adoption immediately. I know that's more work, obviously, um, but I think people uh, will appreciate that. So thank you. And David, I also uh, agree with the staff's recommendation on holding off on those um, two uh, requests for changes and, and taking it through the uh, more involved process. I think that uh, some residents would be surprised to see that change at this point in the uh, adoption of the plan. So need to make sure that they're fully vetted and everybody has an opportunity to weigh in. Any other uh, questions or comments on the comprehensive plan? If not, then uh, Jim, I think we're back to you. Yes, um, just had a few things that I wanted to uh, um, discuss with the council. Um, first of all, our next meeting in October uh, will be a virtual meeting as well. Although we will be in the new city hall, we know that the city council chambers are not gonna be quite ready to, um, uh, to host a meeting at that point in time. So when we met with the the council's subcommittee to, to give us direction on that. We did decide to do the second meeting in October virtual as well. We had, we also had a goal or a challenge um, to try to see if we could have the council chambers ready by the November 2nd meeting uh, for possibly an in-person meeting, but obviously we will wait and see till that time comes closer and, and see where we are as far as uh, COVID. But um, uh, we are going to work to try to get the, the chambers ready and, and uh, in the event that we decide to go with an in-person meeting, but that decision hasn't been made yet. So uh, we will keep the council informed on that. Um, just a note on beggars tonight. Um, we did, we were one of the first communities to go out with some guidelines on beggars night and, and the guidelines, Jan did a great job in pulling together the guidance that we had received from the CDC and Polk County Health, and uh, we've got a, uh, some good guidance um, on how to conduct a safe uh, beggars night. Um, I will tell you that so far, at least uh, as of October 1st, I think about eight communities have indicated that they are going to conduct a, a beggars night. Obviously, everybody's waiting, and certainly if, if uh, uh, if at that time it doesn't s seem advisable to do that, then, then you know, they, different decisions may be made. But many communities are moving forward and, and uh, putting together their guidelines as well. We, uh, we also shared our guidelines with the other communities in the metro and hope that there's some consistency among those guidelines in the communities um, to help avoid any confusion that, that may occur uh, with, um, with what's being proposed. So. Ours, as, as you probably recall, is um, scheduled for um, October 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. would be our normal beggars night. Um, <clears throat> we, um, this week is our, our move week for City Hall. Um, we will be moving on um, Thursday. And then we will, so we'll be closed on Thursday, closed on Friday as our staff works to get the um, new City Hall uh, up and ready to be open to the public. Uh, and then it'll be open to public on, on Monday the 12th. I do want to mention and express a tremendous amount of gratitude to David Wilberding and Cindy Rames. Um, they have been the lead 
staff in um, uh, working on the new city hall and getting things ready to go and particularly coordinating our move. Um, it's, it's been quite an effort, but they've done a great job in communicating with everybody and, and um, getting us ready to, to make the move and then um, uh, be open for our, uh, on October 12th with the new facility. So I just wanted to, to make sure that David and Cindy were, were definitely um, recognized for their efforts there. They've done a fantastic job in getting us prepared for this move. Um, just a reminder, JEDCO's virtual bus tour will be held on Wednesday at four o'clock. Um, you should have received a, an invitation to that, but the, it'll be conducted at Prairie Business Park, which is 200 Southeast 37th. And um, so that would be this Wednesday at four o'clock. Um, uh, uh, we, we are gonna have a short ceremony on Monday the 12th at 5.15. And that'll be a, a retirement of our current city hall. Um, you guys haven't had a meeting there since March. Um, and I know, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, time spent in that meeting. And so we thought we'd take an opportunity to, to just have a short ceremony, um, maybe a last chance for people who would like to walk through the building uh, before um, it gets demolished. And, and uh, an opportunity also to take pictures of some of the uh, people that are have uh, worked out of that building. We've invited um, uh, members of the Planning and Zoning Commission and, and Board of Adjustments, um, and some former council members and, and um, mayors, the uh, li some library uh, folks. The library used to be um, located in the building as well as the library board used to meet there. And then also some police officers um, from, again, they used they were housed in the building as well. So, um, and I think that's all I had for this evening. Um, I know that um, Adam would like to share that the metal sign. We've gotten some feedback from the council on that. That's a you know, project that Adam's been working on um, quite a bit here. So he wants to share the final um, rendition of that metal sign that's gonna be placed at the, um, the concession building in the town center. And then I think uh, Chief McDaniel wants to talk a little bit about um, uh, the upcoming election day. Um, so, Adam, do you want to go ahead and share the this metal sign? Sure. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Cindy, if you could enable a screen share for me. Uh, we did have an extended conversation with OPN and Juice Box about making some of the changes discussed at the last city council meeting. Uh, they did make those changes, and then we shared it uh, with the uh, town center committee, uh, who for two of the three of them that they were in support of it. Uh, but since we had uh, the council meeting today, just thought we'd pull this up real quick. Sorry, Cindy, did you catch that? Are you able to? Uh, I did, I'm not sure I, I can, Adam. Um, is it somewhere on the network that I can find it for you? No, unfortunately uh, with the, the server going down, I didn't get it up there and I guess I can't email it out either. So I will email that out to everybody uh, when the server's back up. And if there's any comments on it, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think we're good to move forward. So we did try to integrate uh, those comments. We included a replacement of the amphitheater uh, and used the Camp Dodge old brick uh, sort of gateway there with that guard house uh, sitting on top of the hill and then replaced uh, where Ripples was with another kind of snow winter activity of a sled kind of uh, combining into that ice skating rink uh, with the, the lady skating there. So I think we have a good number of elements that represent the overall community with the Simpson barn and trails and the water trails, uh, Camp Dodge, Kites on the Green, uh, and a number of town center reflective activities. So hopefully everybody's satisfied with that, but I'll push that out via email and you're welcome to give me any comments. Thank you, Adam. Chief, did you have some comments? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, just wanted to touch very briefly and pretty broadly on the upcoming uh, general election. Um, when, when we have these kinds of things, the police are, are always working hard to try to make sure that it's a secure environment. Um, given some of the unrest that we've seen around the country, there's been a little bit of added interest in, in preparations and, and that sort of things. So I just really wanted to reassure you and the members of the public that may contact you. Uh, the police department is working to, to have some additional staffing to be able to respond should there be any issues with any of our local precincts. Uh, we've got six precincts, according to the Polk County Auditor. They'll be at four different locations, three of which are, are city facilities. So 
we're very familiar with, with all four locations. Um, and, and we will be upstaffing just to ensure the, the safety and quick response should anything arise. So I can talk in greater depth offline if there's anyone that has individual questions, um, but if you would receive some sort of outreach from your constituency, just let them know that, that we're very much involved in, in monitoring things uh, both locally, uh, regionally and nationally for it. Thank you, Dennis. And, and I do just have one other item I wanna mention. Um, late this afternoon, we received uh, an email from Polk County Health Department, and um, uh, they are now have, or they have some um, zip code specific information on COVID, the 14 day positivity rate that they're sharing uh, across the, 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 uh, the state. And, and uh, they actually shared the Polk County uh, statistics this, um, today. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, our, our, I was, wasn't able to, to forward that to you because of the um, power outage and the problems with the server today. Um, but what basically what it says, it shows in the 50131, which is Johnston, our 14-day positivity rate is 0 to 5% um, for COVID. It looks like Cindy's going to be able to bring the map up here, and we can, again, we'll share this with you. Uh, so if you look at... Um, uh, we're, yeah, you can look at the scale there. So zero to five is the darker green and Johnson's 50131. So you can see where we stand. Um, the lighter green is um, uh, six to seven and then eight to nine, a uh, couple of other areas. And then um, the uh, yellow is 10 to 15%. So this does show where, uh, where we currently are in that 14 day positivity rate. Um, we just wanted to share the information. Um, and again, I will, I will forward this to you as soon as we're able. Maybe Cindy can go ahead and do it, I guess, uh, um, now that you have that up. But to we, um, this was new information that uh, was given to us um, to be able to share publicly now. So I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware of it and we will, we will get this information to you. That's all I have this evening. Sure. Okay, well, let's uh, go quickly to the city council members. We do have a couple of closed uh, uh, sessions this evening, but let's, uh, let's go around the horn here real quick. Uh, Councilwoman Martin? Nothing. Councilman Cope? I'll pass, thank you. Councilman Soroika? I'll pass too, thanks. Councilman Evans? One little thing. Um, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> um, I, I, just to, I just wanted to say to everybody, so I'm just finishing up on my, this is the 13th of 14 days in quarantine. One of my new daughters tested positive um, a couple weeks ago. Um, she, we have now lived through this. She was very sick, um, but now is doing very well. Um, and I guess... I was one of those that I wore a mask, but I, you know, thought, oh, I'll never get it. We'll never get it. And then we got it. So just for what it's worth, please protect yourself. It is real. So that's it. Thank you for sharing that, Councilman Evans. Um, I think the only one that was left was Councilman Reddy. Yes, uh, I'll pass, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well with that, we've gone through our, uh, and I, I don't have anything to add either, so. Mayor, can, this is Janet Wilwarding. Yes. Um, I just wanted to remind um, everyone that I had sent out your information last week about the community survey. So if you have any input or questions that you want added um, or any changes, please let me know by end of day tomorrow. We would love to keep that moving forward. Um, we'll be sending out the business survey as well. I'm working in conjunction with Adam um, to get that put together. So as soon as we have a draft, we will send it out to you for review. Okay, very good. Thank you, Janet. Anything else for the go to the order? If not, I will take a motion to go into closed session. So moved. So moved. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Council Member Martin. Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? 
Yes. Evans. Yes. Motion passed. So we'll see you all on the other side. So do we, how do we do this? I mean, I, I, was, I was not, just, Cindy emailed us something with how to call in. Right. So, right. so there's a, there should be another link for you, Tom, to go to the um, closed sessions and then there'll be breakout rooms in there for each of the closed sessions. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just didn't, wasn't tracking that, that with an email. That, about it should that. be right next to the other two that you got, Tom. Okay, I'll go look for them. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs>